Welcome back. A little coffee break. Uh, it's actually really nice uh, for to go after Ronnie's talk um, because I can use it as a preamble to sort of um, my talk, which is, I guess, I'm not going to talk at all really about scale build up or corrosion or anything like that. Even, I might touch on it now and then because you, you can't separate the two and they need to all work together. Um, but if we look at everything that we just went through and specifically the bit where we talked about ideal water, especially um, TDS and this idea of 150 in these ranges, that's what I want to burrow into is those those concepts and those ideas. Um, and I always start this by um, telling a little story. So um, what is good water? Well, the, that's the question I guess we just looked at and we, we gave some ranges. And so my shop in Bath is a multi-roaster cafe and we use coffee from lots of different people. Uh, we cut the coffee, we brew the coffee, we decide what we think is good and what we'd like to use. And then we end up building relationships with certain roasters and certain uh, suppliers. And we work with them and we, we develop relationships. Uh, and if their head roaster or their quality control changes, you know, we might not jive with what they do anymore. But it's a bit odd when um, we think we're on something and we've got coffee that should taste good. You know, we've done everything. So we've looked at the equipment side of things, we've looked at an understanding of brewing theory, um, and we think we've covered everything. And it doesn't taste good for some reason. And it was a particular experience I had with a coffee that tasted really bad. So really quite sour and dull. Uh, and nobody likes to phone up a roaster and say, oh, bad news, the coffee's rubbish. So, um, but, uh, but we've got an industry which is built on that feedback loop. So um, I phoned them up and I told them, and they said, you know, send it back straight away and we'll, we'll cup it and we'll see how we get on with it. And they were devastated at the concept or the idea of it being that bad. Uh, so I sent it back, and then about a week later, they phoned me up and said, nah, it's fine, don't know what you're on about. Uh, and so initially what happens is you think, oh, maybe we, it's very easy in coffee, we're, we're having conversations across the globe or across the country, and maybe we just disagree, maybe we have different ideas of good. But then you've tasted coffee with these people, you've done Q-Grader together, you know you don't disagree that heavily on what you think is at least pleasant. You may disagree on what your favourite coffee is or what you think is outstanding. Um, so it didn't make sense. We went through all of our variables, and we looked at you know, the brewing equipment we were using and how old the coffee was from roast, the temperature we were using, the extractions we were hitting, so on and so forth. Um, and then we sort of came across water quite quickly and said, what's your, what's your water spec? I think a lot of people in the room will have used the TDS meter before. They're pretty cheap. Um, they're basically an ionic conductivity meters. They have two little, two little um, metal points, basically, and they measure how quickly the ions move between the points. And it gives you a number which is supposed to relate to the amount of stuff in your water. Um, at this moment in time, I'd read the SCAA book and I'd, you know, come across a little bit about water, all the lights are going down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, great. And uh, so, so, so the number I heard a lot was 150 TDS. And um, generally I've been given sort of two ideas, which is we don't want really soft water because we need minerals to pull flavour out. But we don't want hard water because it pulls out. Well, at the time I was told that the water was too full of minerals, so it was too heavily saturated, so I couldn't fit enough coffee flavour in. And so th these are the two ideas I was given. The reason we wanted the middle one was because either end did the opposite to each other. Basically, one didn't extract enough out. There was a perfect place in the middle, and then we couldn't get enough out because of saturation. Um, turns out that their water was, on the TDS meter, pretty similar to ours, um, about a 10 to 20 ppm uh, difference between the two. Uh, and actually, something really stuck with me. The roaster said to me at the time, he said, oh, I hate water, because I always wonder what the true representation of the coffee is. You know, if the water has such a big impact on the way the coffee tastes, and we're trying to set all these variables in place, and we're trying to weigh shots and understand brewing, but ultimately this huge element of what we're doing is um, changing everywhere. And effectively, you could call it water terroir. It's the, when you have a coffee somewhere with someone's water, you're tasting a coffee which has a sense of place. And part of that sense of place isn't just the grinder or the person making it, it's also the water that was used. Um, it sounds kind of cool on one hand, but on another hand, it's really annoying. 
so that, that therein began a project um, to study in depth the existing material and knowledge in the industry. And I collaborated with a chemist um, called Christopher H. Hendon, who's a computational chemist, which means everything he does is theoretical. You have experimental chemists and also who do much more physical lab work, but everything he does is on computers, it's all calculations. Um, so he comes into the shop. Luckily, we've got the, the university up the road, and, and we get interesting people in the shop, and they're interested in coffee problems. Um, and so we began. He said, oh, let's take some water, let's take it up to the lab, and let's start looking at it. I think somebody asked Ronnie earlier how you assess the specifics of your water. Um, if you want a full breakdown, you have to send it to a lab and pay for it, basically, which I didn't have to do because he's a friend. Yeah. So um, yeah, we sent this water off, and we started looking at it. And um, he got more and more intrigued. And so we started covering these concepts. And very quickly, it became apparent that the first concept, the very empty soft water, is 100% true. Um, the minerals, specifically calcium and magnesium, uh, will increase your ability to extract flavors from the coffee. Um, loads of other minerals in the water have a negligible impact on your extraction, but you taste them, like sodium, for example. But sodium won't extract anything that water wouldn't on its own. So sodium, although if it's there in too big a quantities, might taint the cup from a flavor point of view, it won't affect the extraction. And that's really sort of the way I started looking at water, was before, a lot of our customers would say, oh, I find a water I really like the taste of, like a good water. And then I get a coffee I really like, and I put them together, and I should get something good. Uh, it just doesn't work like that at all. So ultimately, it's important to not see water as an ingredient, but to see it as a solvent. That's what you're doing. You're using it as a solvent to extract um, coffee into it. And you're interested in how it does that job. Something you might not be able to taste in the water without coffee in it gets magnified once you extract coffee into it because of the way it did that job. So uh, we had a paper published, in a, which Ronnie cited earlier, uh, which was looking at those binding energies, is what they're called. So the ability for both calcium and magnesium to bind to different compounds in the, that are typical in coffee. We chose uh, several compounds that we think are quite typical, some of them very pleasant, like citric acid, which pops up in all coffee. Um, some that in abundance can be less enjoyable, something like chlorogenic acid. Uh, and like Ronnie said, the calcium will bind slightly less strongly than the magnesium. But what's interesting is if you achieve the same extraction using magnesium and calcium, there is definitely um, research there to suggest that the magnesium and the calcium would have different preferences for what they took. So they would organize what they took out of the coffee slightly differently, which is interesting, which means um, the magnesium and calcium, although they both help you pull flavor out, they might do that job slightly differently, which is an interesting question for flavor. So whilst we were doing this, uh, we, there was still one nagging sort of question in the back of our minds. It's like, this is cool. This is really interesting. So if, if the minerals help you pull flavor out, then why, why does hard water taste so dull, flat, and uninteresting with coffee? It doesn't make sense. Theoretically, more minerals should pull more flavor out, and the coffee should get bigger and fuller. Um, considering coffee is a lot of what we taste in coffee is predominantly weak acids, it should get bigger and more acidic, not flatter. Um, and that's where that second part of the theory that sort of was banded around, sort of like old wives' tales, really, um, was wrong, which is the saturation point. So 400 ppm in water is, is still not a lot. You know, it's, it's a lot when we're talking about making a cup of coffee and it becomes meaningful, but it's not a lot in terms of saturation point at all. And so, uh, then we got really interested in the role of bicarbonate or alkalinity. Unfortunately, it has lots of different names, which makes it annoying to talk about. We actually tend to talk about it as the buffering system of the water. Um, so most liquids will have a buffering system. And like Ronnie was saying about equilibrium, that's basically its job is to maintain a pH. That doesn't necessarily mean a neutral pH. It means the pH at which the water is happy at, or that solution. So if you take human blood, for example, uh, we have a pH of between 7.25 and 7.45, uh, and we need that to stay alive. So um, we need to stop that solution going either acidic or alkaline if certain acidic or alkaline compounds make their way into that solution. And so it's quite amazing. Uh, it's a bit of sort of A-level chemistry, really. But um, most compounds have something called a conjugate partner, uh, which I describe as the evil twin of itself. Um, or an altered state. So if we take a, an, an acid which we taste a lot, citric acid, citric acid is an acid, but if you knock the proton off it, it becomes momentarily alkaline. It's like an altered state to try and push the pH back towards um, wherever it was before. 
So from a flavor point of view, that means you've got two things happening. You've got minerals pulling flavor out, and then you've got the buffer. The buffer will do some physical things as well. So it will have an impact on, again, like the flow rate of the, of the brewed coffee. And there's some other interesting physical properties there. But also what it's going to do is it's going to organize the flavor in your liquid, which in this case is a cup of coffee. So we like acidity in coffee. Speciality coffee is driven by aromatics and by acidity. Positive acidity, you know, negative experience of acidity like sourness sort of develop a bad correlation with what acidity means for people and for customers. But ultimately, great coffee is all driven by a strong element of acidity. So we're using the minerals to pull out all of this acidity out. And then the buffer, unfortunately, can, can sort of damage all of that hard work, really. It can, um, sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> the end of the talk. Um, so it can damage all the hard work that the, that the minerals have done. And so ultimately, we then drew a correlation that the higher the buffer, the more eager the water was to stop the pH dropping. A typical cup of coffee is around five, a little bit above, between sort of five, five and a half pH. So it's an acidic beverage. So, um, so the stronger the buffer, the more likely it doesn't want those acids to be in their acid state. And that's why the cup goes from to tasting dull, flat, and bitter, and sort of earthy. It's not that we haven't extracted acids we like, it's that we've then sort of ruined them or completely unbalanced them in the cup. And so then we could draw correlations between the amount of minerals, so the calcium and magnesium, and the amount of bicarbonate and what that would mean. So theoretically, you should be able to look at a bottle of water and go, oh, okay, high bicarb, low magnesium calcium. That should be an empty cup of coffee because we can't pull a lot of flavor out, but it should also be really flat because the bicarb will destroy the acidity. Um, limits of TDS, we kind of covered that quickly. I'm doing this now. So let's pop on to the graph that we've done. Just before I show you the graph, uh, it's not finished. So um, I keep looking at it and I keep wanting to tweak it and change it. But it gives you a good idea of what we're talking about, which is TDS. When you've got TDS at extremes is a useful indicator. But when you get into these realms of what's the difference, oh, not very good at this. When you get into the realms of 120 TDS to 160 TDS, you know, well, what is the difference? What does it mean? And then you can even achieve the same TDS and have a completely different flavor, which is what we were having with this roaster at the beginning of the talk. Um, and so we were keen to, to move beyond TDS. And um, TDS, that last slide, a couple back, said that TDS is limited. So it doesn't show you what your, fully what your bicarbonate content is. So you can have a TDS that reads at 150, but it can have a bicarb of 150, um, which is a problem. So what we wanted to do was move away from using TDS as our primary understanding of coffee brewing water and move over to thinking about the relationship between the buffer, which is along the bottom axis, and the calcium magnesium content, which is along the uh, vertical axis. Um, like we were sort of saying earlier, if you want to understand exactly how much calcium and magnesium you have in your water, you have to send it to a lab. So for the purposes of practically understanding your water into relation to coffee, we put those two together. And that's what the drop test kit will tell you. We call it general hardness. It's calcium and magnesium as a combined entity. Um, and even though there'll be slight differences in what calcium and magnesium do, uh, this for me is the most significant way to talk about water. Yeah. So, um, Cool. So what we've done is it's a bit like a brewing chart, really, like a filter brewing chart. Uh, and <coughs> let's say you take the same coffee, like you did outside a minute ago, and you brew it with waters with these different properties. We should see these kind of flavor results. So um, hard water, somewhere like London tap water, bath's really hard, top right-hand side. So you pull a lot of flavor out because there's a lot of minerals, but that flavor becomes dull, heavy, just quite unpleasant, really. Um, bottom end is um, interesting because there's definitely a, you know, a purity concept with water. Um, in Copenhagen, there's a company called Coffee Collective, and their water in Copenhagen is really, really hard. And so they reverse osmosis it right down. And a friend of mine was out there tasting coffee with them, and he said, oh, what are you doing with the water? And they were discussing it like most people do in coffee, which is the TDS. So they said, oh, our TDS is... Uh, 35 to 40. And he sort of said, oh, why is it so low? And they said, oh, 
we wanted to make the purest coffee possible, so we made our water pure. Um, and I think you'll see from both of our presentations that that, that concept just doesn't hold true. You need non-pure water to, to, you know, to, to pull out the flavor, to, to really explore the purity of the coffee. Um, yeah, so then you can chart everything. We split up the filter and we split up the espresso. That's sort of um, a question we're posing there. You know, ideally, I'd be more than happy to use the multi-purpose water. Um, but it is interesting because of the increased sort of acidity that we can struggle with in espresso. A higher buffer can often sort of balance that out quite easily. Um, and then filter a coffee down at the bottom. I'll give you a couple of stories. So the water project's been really exciting for me because it's filled in a lot of communication gaps. And so on the one hand, embracing the idea of water as part of the terroir of coffee is interesting. Because ultimately, every roaster around the world roasts their coffee to water. They just don't know they're doing it. So they buy some green coffee that they really like, um, which was roasted to a water. So maybe that affects their buying choice if they, it's roasted somewhere else and they test it in their, in their shop or their QC department. But anyway, they, they think, oh, it's a bit acidic, it's a bit this, it's a bit dry, it's a bit underdeveloped, so on and so forth. But they basically develop the coffee to taste the best it possibly can with that water. They tailor it to that water. And that's what was happening at the beginning of the talk with that story. And it's what's happening all over the world. And it means our shared experience comes harder. I get sent some coffee from a roaster in America or a coffee roaster in Hong Kong. And they're like, what do you think? I sort of ask them what their water's like. And go, oh, it makes sense. Your water's really, really soft. You have no buffer. So the acidity is overwhelming. So you've roasted it a bit darker. Um, and so although I like the idea of terroir with water, I prefer the idea of a shared experience and an even playing field to really focus on coffee's quality, um, which is why I would push for more consistent water around the globe. But then, of course, like Ronnie pointed out, it's difficult. There's different solutions in different areas, very different problems we face to try and get water into a spec that we like. Um, and what's interesting, of course, is if a, if a coffee was roasted to the water at the bottom, bottom left, and then we brewed it with the water in the middle section, it would probably taste worse. So our premium or our optimum water would actually produce a, a worse cup of coffee. Um, we'll just go through the coffee tasted outside. Um, it's quite an unusual coffee, actually. It's Papua New Guinea coffee. I find it a little bit salty. Uh, but you still, you still manage to, you, you will have tasted the difference, I'm sure. So we'll start on the left-hand side. Uh, so the first coffee taste on the left, that should have been uh, Ashbeck water from Tesco, which is basically very, very soft water has a low buffer um, and so basically yeah a bit, a bit weird tasting a bit, a bit sour probably the, the most unpleasant acidity out of the three um, I think soft water can do well in coffee because we value acidity and we taste let's say we had two waters we had a really hard water and a really soft water we go for the soft one every time because we get some acidity we get something that's you know that opens up in our mouth but um, so I think it can soft water can be a default quite often um, so then the middle one was, so the middle and the right hand side were waters that have the same TDS reading. They both read about 170, okay? Um, so that's my favorite example, the middle and the right hand side. The middle one reads at 170 on TDS, but has a huge bicarbonate content. So um, it's flattening a lot of the acidity completely. So you should have found the middle one tasted quite sort of dull, sort of earthy, chalky getting nods of approval from the crowd. Um, and then the, front, the one on the right hand side was the same TDS, but a more preferable relationship between the minerals and the buffering. So we get a more balanced cup of coffee and one that displays a bit more of that character, that provenance of that coffee as well. I mean, it's an interesting thing to do it with. And then you do get into some interesting areas where you start saying, well, maybe different waters will be preferable for different coffees as well. Um, again, if we could easily produce different waters on the spot, uh, then that would be maybe something interesting to consider. But otherwise, I think it's worth finding common ground. Um, um, the, an example really is um, the World Barista Championships. So 54 countries um, hold a championship, a national championship, and someone wins, and then that person goes to a world championship, and we all congregate somewhere. But the water sponsor, the WBC, has a really tough job, which is they move the damn thing around every year which is nice, but it's not good for keeping a consistent water source at all. And it means the, the job that the water sponsor has is very, very different depending on the year and what they have to achieve. And so 
um, what often happens is they try and get it in a range which um, is stable and that we feel is acceptable. Uh, and I guess that's probably what I'd like to challenge moving forward is what, what is an acceptable range? Is, it, is hitting a certain TDS acceptable? Or do we definitely, I think we really need to try and hit that bicarbonate um, content, definitely the, the bottom end, the buffer. If you bring a, an, a, an aromatic acidic coffee to a competition where the buffer's twice what you expected it to be, you, you're buggered really, to be honest. If you bring a natural coffee along that's a bit fuller bodied and doesn't have as much delicate acidity, then you might get along better. But do you really want to do that? Do you really want to, should we be, should we be benefiting certain coffees like that? No. So um, I think maybe we should uh, consider making water for the World British Championships. Um, it doesn't mean it will be the natural source water there, but it means that people could possibly um, replicate it around the world um, with distilled water and um, magnesium calcium salts and sodium bicarb. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where we end up really, which is um, moving forward, the, the research that exists in the industry with continued research will hopefully improve the dialogue that we all have with each other. Something like the Q-Graders, for example, is, is supposed to build a common language uh, right across the industry, and it was actually invented predominantly for farmers, so they understood what the specialized coffee was in, about, and they could grow their coffee to that and um, increase their earning potential and, and, and everything they're doing. And so an increased understanding of water right across the field, especially right down to people brewing coffee and any company working with coffee, they, that dialogue needs to become more complex and the education needs to improve, but we also need to learn more, uh, which brings me on to further studies. Um, there's lots more we can do so, to research in a laboratory. Water is extremely complex and so is coffee, so it makes it a very difficult topic to, to um, explore. But exciting all the same, a bit like the whole world of coffee really, you know, finding out exciting things all the time. Some, sometimes we learn that something we knew 20 years ago is correct and we deviated from it for a while and other times we overturn orthodoxy and move forward in other ways. Yeah, that brings me to an end. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yep. Essentially what I um, understood, you're yeah, talking about... Could you turn on the microphone, please? Um, uh, essentially what I understood, you, you're talking about, that, let's call it the water design. Mm -hmm. um, designing water mm -hmm. for pretty much every brewing method. Well, yes, and uh, yeah, maybe I was misleading that. I think for something like WBC, we need to, to try and create a consistent platform for a global competition. Uh, in other areas, then I actually think you often the most plausible thing is to do the best thing you can with the source water. Um, so, so, so your solution becomes very different. You may, in a very soft water area, it's very challenging to remineralize that water. So you might be better staying with the softer water and possibly that changes the roaster you buy from. So I'm not suggesting a sort of simple, we can just all use the same water around the world and design it. But um, definitely, whenever we choose a filtration system, we're designing our water in some way. We're choosing which way to take it. But um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously in an ideal world, in some, you know, sort of a conceptual world, we could make it to a specific spec, but that's not realistic. So it's understanding what we're going to do with our water, what our best solution is. But the idea of the research is what that means for flavor, but also what that means for the conversation you're having with a roaster or a coffee producer. Yeah. Yep. When you're saying you're every roastering is basically roasting to water. To, to their water. Yep. So how can you can you change how can you as you're saying you're designing water, how would you go about getting more buffer or less buffer or more? Yeah, I mean um, yeah, go on. Yeah, so, no, no, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. So that's um it's difficult, so and it's probably not plausible in a lot of ways. I mean, so let's say you have a roastery in London, and you 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 understand the water of the the account you're dealing with, and then you you say this is what we do with our water. And this, you know, you know when somebody sends out a brewing spec, and they say, oh, we use BST eighteen gram baskets. We do this. We do this. We do this. And that water spec becomes part of what you do, and it becomes part of that information, as opposed to actually making the water exactly the same. Um, and so I think that's 
that's probably what would happen moving forward. Um, you can make, there's a friend of mine who runs a roastery in Canada, uh, Phil and Sebastian in Calgary, and they um, really struggled with a Nordic uh, coffee competition, which is where they, they've tasted coffee all around the world and they lean towards slightly brighter aromatic acidic coffees. And they were always surprised when they got back the information from the competition yearly that the coffee didn't taste anything like that. In fact, it was their cupping notes were that it was flat, bitter, roasty. Um, and so what they did is they researched the spec of the water that the competition was uh, w with which the competition was taking place, and then they actually made the water using calcium magnesium salts and sodium bicarb. He then decided that the batch of coffee that he wanted to submit to the competition, he would roast solely to the water he had made. Uh, and after five years of, well, I can't remember how many years venturing, but yeah, this year he got in for the first year by roasting the water, the, the coffee to the water that was going to be used for the competition. Yeah, so I think that's the best example of matching a coffee to water. Yeah. Ronnie? I have one question. I, I love your graph. Um, how does the uh, the way the coffee has been treated, meaning um, natural, uh, for, uh, washed, or semi -washed, washed or washed or salt, how does it impact on your uh, test results with the different ones? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, like you'd expect, the cer certain elements in the water that would um, push the coffee in a certain way would exaggerate, so an acidic coffee would become let's say a sort of a coffee that was slightly whiny, maybe borderline sour, so a coffee that was left to ferment for quite a while in washing stations. The um, so magnesium, for example, could tip that over the edge into becoming unpleasantly sour. Um, washed coffees suffered the most from high bicarb, definitely. Uh, so a bit like I said with competition, choosing a natural. I mean, these are sort of, you know, of course, it gets very complex, depending on the specific coffee and the way they've used that processing. But if you understand how the the mineral content and the relationship of bicarb to general hardness impacts flavor, then you can make some predictions based on how that might best suit your coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Steve? What kind of filtrations are you using at your cafe and how do you go about sustaining quality? Yeah, yeah. so we've got a couple uh, different things going on. Um, and we've got two stores. Um, different solution on brew bar, different solution on espresso bar. Um, yeah, so we're we're kind of lucky that our pH is quite high coming in. So, um, for example, what we can do with a simple cartridge filter is lower our bicarb without sacrificing the pH to go too low. But if you had a hard water area and you had to put the bypass on really tight to get the bicarb right down, the pH sort of becomes progressively lower, which is when you start getting all your corrosion issues. And also, I didn't touch on pH, but pH impacts flavor as well. Um, and it's really interesting is that talking of equilibrium and water's equilibrium, uh, we actually made some waters with really wild pHs. <laughs> Crazy. Um, <laughs> we, made, we made a water with a um, pH of 11, so very, very alkaline, uh, one that we wouldn't want to consume. But then we made a cup of coffee out of it, and the pH got down to five, just like the cup we made with a pH of water of six. So it seems that the water um, is going to get down to around that point before it cuts off. So if you start with a higher pH, um, you're going to pull more acids out to get that pH right down, basically, basically to get that cup of coffee right down to five. Um, so that's interesting as well. So pH will impact flavor as well. It's very easy to talk about calcium and magnesium. Um, yeah, there's some magnesium exchange cartridges on the market. Their, their idea is that they swap um, so exchange column and you swap uh, some of the calcium in your water for magnesium. The, they are interesting, but they do have a fluctuation throughout their life. Between They give you a lot of magnesium at the beginning and then less over time. And their life is quite short as well. Um, but that's a, another example, I guess, of playing around with your water. If you pick that solution, you're altering your water by adding in more magnesium. Um, yeah, so and then, I mean, and then so, a roaster, if you go back to the chart, there's a roaster in Ross on Y called James Gourmet. Does anyone know James? Peter? James? No, no one. Oh, you do. So um, Peter had always said to me for years, oh, I don't get this whole sort of light roast thing. It tastes really acidic. 
But obviously, it's difficult to talk about roast colour. Uh, if you don't know what people's references are, you can have an underdeveloped white roast coffee that you know, is pretty rubbish. But um, there was lots of coffees that he said to me he really didn't like, and I thought it was a palate thing. His espresso was quite dark. Um, and he, but he'd come into the shop, and then he'd taste the coffee, uh, and I'd often get really worried about serving it to him, because I think, oh, he's going to hate this. <laughs> Um, but he'd go, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, who's that from? He'd be really surprised, and he'd put it down to equipment, and he'd put it down to the way I brewed it and stuff. And although I wanted to take all the credit for the way the coffee tasted, um, as soon as this project happened, there was a few people I got in touch with, and he was one of them. I was like, can you send me some of your water? And he's an example of naturally occurring water that has quite low bicarb, which is not that common. For a water that has a, a high TDS, anything coming out of the tap, sort of up 200 and up, tends to have a fair bit of bicarb. But for some reason, to do with his location, his water source, it's quite low. But his water was about 200 TDS, so he took a cartridge filter and he um, put the bypass on tight and he brought the, the TDS down to um, about 140 and he thought what he was doing was great. But he didn't have much bicarb to start with and by filtering it heavily through a cartridge, he was destroying any bicarb he did have, which meant that his coffee was down in the, um, well, it was the top left-hand side. So plenty of minerals to pull out flavour, but, but dull, sour, and just sort of, yeah, really nasty tasting. So actually, he would be better off with an RO system. He's already got a very nice relationship between his calcium, magnesium, and buffer. He just needs to bring it down a little bit. Um, or if he wanted to stick with his cartridge, he'd be better off letting the TDS go up. Um, what's interesting about scale buildup is you need the bicarb there for the calcium ions and the magnesium to become calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. So you, so you, um. So what's happening there is if you if you didn't take the bicarb too high, even though his water's hard, he shouldn't get loads and loads of scale. But so he's got a couple of choices there that are going to fundamentally change the way he roasts his coffee and how he then communicates with his um, with his customers, basically. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Thinking of um, contact time and temperature, mm -hmm. how does that play out, if at all, have any effect on what sort of water you're using? Yeah, I think like Ronnie popped on earlier with the example of the bicarb. Uh, you know when you um, you sort of get some soap in a you know a hard water area and a soft water area, and the way the soap reacts, there is physical properties of coffee's extraction process that are impacted on by bicarbonate. Um, it, within the small changes, you know, so we're not looking at huge changes there really. My top end for bicarb is 100. Um, I would be inclined, we haven't done enough physical tests, but I would be inclined to say that, so I was achieving the same sort of extractions, you see, when we were doing tests, to try and um, to try and see how much, obviously our idea was we want to know how much of this is to do with the um, organisation of the flavour in the cup, not the extraction, if you see what I mean. Um, generally, people will find with really soft water, it's a bit harder to achieve higher extractions, which which makes sense if, if you bear in mind the mineral binding power. But there does seem to be a point when you start to get hard water that it's hard to extract a lot again, which suggests that the buffer, the bicarbonate, uh, makes it harder to extract things from coffee, which would be a physical process as opposed well, and a chemical one, but yeah. So um, yeah, definitely has an impact. Wouldn't like to go into any more detail than I've just gone into. <coughs> Jeffrey? Okay, I mean, what, what you're talking about here is fascinating, actually. I think it grabs, it's really interesting the way that you've kind of encapsulated um, a concept. Now, I'm a, I'm a fairly lay person when it comes to water quality, so I'm not a coffee maker, but I'm <coughs> to look at trends in the marketplace, etc. This conversation around water is, in our view, kind of very much the, you know, fourth wave, the science of coffee. How, how far away do you think we are into this topic of water becoming more important. I mean, do we do we do we feel that the industry as a whole is just totally ignorant of this and it's only the the very, very you know, obsessed, coffee obsessed. I mean do you, do Yeah, we... I think um yeah, I'm sort of not the best person to ask because I hang around with other coffee obsessives. <laughs> but um I like Ronnie was saying outside, you know, a lot of people in the room, a lot of people I speak to deal with a very different marketplace. And yeah, I think um it's very easy to forget about water. It's very easy to focus on. Even in the geeky side, it's you know you can see the difference a grinder makes, or you can see the difference temperature makes to a particular machine. But you need that comparison with water, uh, and it requires a bit more. You have to go out your way really to sort of notice its impact. Um, at the same time, people are really interested because it can have huge ram 
you know, huge ramifications on, on businesses that, are, that have a huge reach across countries and across the world. Um, so it's about whether it's financially viable for them and whether it benefits them to pursue water in a different way to what they are now. You see what I mean? Do you see what I mean? Like, is it, you know, it's interesting and maybe we could have an R&D project and develop a piece of equipment that might achieve, make it easier to achieve a specific water. Um, is it worth doing that? You know, is there, is there enough interest there? Is there enough value? I mean, we've definitely seen a lot of interest during this project. Um, I don't know what Ronnie thinks about the increased interest in water, but I think there's more interest than ever. As people care more about coffee, the details that maybe we weren't so keen on before become more apparent. Great. Yeah. Anyone else? Go on. If you allow me, I see on your uh, on the graph you're working with the uh, carbonates up to 100 and TDS to 200 ppm. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do testing with higher levels, meaning carbonates higher than 100? Yeah. 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 We did. Uh, it was interesting because um, because you start to build this ratio, right? So this this much to this much, um, and as we took it up, we could achieve surprisingly nice results at high ppm's if we kept the relationship of bicarb general hardness um, in a positive relationship. But we did also the coffee became sort of lost a lot of its clarity, a lot of its complexity, um, and it's almost like you were over extracting basically. Um, so yeah, we, we took it right up and we achieved some results that were pleasant. You know, we made a water that was 800 uh, ppm, and by playing around with what we had in that 800, we achieved something that was quite pleasant, but it was nowhere near as good as where we put the range, basically. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. One more oh, question, one, yeah. One more. Um, taking on board well, what we speak about um, the industry itself of coffee, mm -hmm. um, basically people don't care about water. Uh, <clears throat> what I was asking, what what you advise to the baristas, because we can't do anything about water. So, yeah, sure, sure. So what do you think we can do? <laughs> Sneak in at night and change the. Uh, <laughs> 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 what do you think we can do to take the most we can from the from the coffee beans? Yeah, I think so. When I, when I sort of teach brewing courses and we go through everything and we get onto water and I sort of teach it like this and the person's like, oh, blimey. Um, but for me, it's sort of the, the waters that, if you, you know, if coffee is a puzzle, it's, you know, a big piece of the puzzle and it's about understanding it and doing what you, what, what you can and making decisions based off being informed about your water. That's why I would say really, I mean, if a, if a you know, if, if a company is suffering, is struggling to achieve the quality of coffee at once, a bit like I was at the beginning of the talk, um, that should be part of that conversation. Is it the coffee roaster? Do we blame them? Well, no, not unless we've explored everything else first. Uh, they get blamed a lot. But um, so yeah, I think it just, you know, I, it, without giving me a specific example of a specific problem, you know, uh, I couldn't give you a, a detailed outline of exactly how you would tackle it. But a lot of the time it's, yeah, bearing it in mind in your processes as a barista and, you know, you, you'll come into contact with, I mean, retail coffee, every barista sells a bit of retail coffee and the customers, you know, so the honest ones, well, no, because some of them go, oh, my coffee tastes way better at home. Like, okay. So the, um, maybe it does, maybe it does. But um, a lot of customers will say, look, I've done everything. I'm weighing, I've bought this grinder, I've bought this, I've done all this, it's still nothing like it tastes here. And um, often that's the water. But obviously because coffee businesses are filtering their water predominantly uh, to achieve maintenance of their machine. So what they're doing in the meanwhile is they're achieving, they tend to, not always, like Peter was over filtering his water and there's other problems, but they tend to nearly always produce preferable coffee water. So most coffee shops have a one a step up on most home brewers in that they're more likely to be able to brew good coffee than the person at home. So I engage a lot of my customers with the topic of water and they see some of the biggest gains from from, from that conversation. Right. If you allow me, it's not because of the barista behind the counter that you have no word to say. The reason why we train baristas uh, with the SAE and everything around is that you should be able to recognize an issue and tell your boss about it. If you think that the coffee could be better with a different kind of water, please tell your boss, the owner, the, the chain, and explain them what you learn and what you do. This is why we train baristas. 
is recognize how you could improve still with a, a little detail of impact, uh, improve your business. So please do not keep it for yourselves. Talk about it. That's the reason why we do these lectures, these studies, uh, to help you to get more and better uh, out of your coffee. Okay, one last question, then we got to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, I think currently the, the home brewing is, is a growing trend. Yeah. And uh, what I'm going to ask is, you mentioned a few brands. You've used it for brewing, uh, Tesco. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you have any experience what water, what particular make or brand is actually? Yeah. It's, yeah. Kind of better for for the home brewers. Uh, and also whether you can uh, tell something about how the packaging affects what a big plastic or glass. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't like to comment on that last one. I don't know enough about that. But the plastic big glass. But um, yeah, I mean, like Ronnie said, you know, picking different bottles off the shelf and um, looking at the different spec. Most of them are way too hard. I mean, you buy mineral water because it's full of minerals, <laughs> and then you <laughs> don't want them in there for the coffee. But um, so like yeah, Waitrose Essentials not bad. Um, Volvic was one that people talked about for a long time, but for me the buff is too high. It's about eighty. Um, Ashbeck, like I said, brings out a lot of acidity, but I think it's actually, you know, it's there's not enough buff and there's not enough mineral binding energy, so the copies are a bit underwhelming. So Waitrose Essential, and then uh, simple. A lot of people in a hard water area will see simple improvements with simple filter jugs. You know, um, that's definitely going to give them a better result than what they got before. Uh, and then some of the people I know who are, uh, haven't been satisfied with that have gone and made the water, bought some brewing salts. Uh, it's very common in uh, the brewing industry for beer, for home brewers to, to add, add, add brewing salts. Yeah, yeah. So you buy them online um, if you, if you want to go to go to that level. Yeah, that's, it's not, it sounds really intense, but it's, it's quite simple. Yeah. So that's probably the next option, yeah. That's right. All right. Thanks Thank to you. Maxwell. I'm sure everyone still has questions. There's actually drinks outside, so feel free to, to grab a beer, hang out in the, in the uh, bar area. Thank you for coming, guys. Thank <laughs> you.